So, well, thank you very much for, for the kind invitation and for the organizers, uh, Ruth, uh, Alan, and Timo. It's a pleasure to be here. I was very, uh, very uh, enthusiastic to, to see all the talks. And uh, uh, actually, this is the has been the, uh, the case. So, um, so this is a, a simplified view of how brain uh, functions, uh, including prefrontal cortex, with the caveat that we have to in uh, include many uh, concepts that uh, we have uh, discussed uh, here in the previous uh, in the previous talks. Uh, but the idea is, is, is as follows. Uh, so we have simultaneous representation of offers and options in visual cortex. Uh, we have um, simultaneous preparation of uh, motor plans in premotor cortex and in other uh, frontal uh, areas. Uh, there is competition between these motor plans uh, mediated by uh, by attention until one uh, motor plan is executed uh, is executed. So this idea uh, originates from many studies that uh, have shown that uh, it is possible to prepare and maintain uh, several mo uh, simple motor plans, uh, for instance, like uh, saccades, uh, that can be sustained for a while until one of them is, uh, is uh, executed. So this is possible because of the existence of, uh, of uh, motor maps. Uh, this means essentially the representation of all possible simple motor actions that you can perform uh, on, the neural uh, on the neural tissue. But the question is, uh, what happens when we go to more abstract, uh, complex uh, decisions? So in more uh, abstract and complex decisions, the existence of uh, motor maps is, is doubtful. So this is the, the penseur, the, the thinker uh, by Rodin. Uh, it nicely illustrates the fact that complex decision making involves the, the selection of a sequence of, of actions uh, from now into the future. And uh, having uh, motor maps, for all possible sequences that you may uh, think of uh, is uh, very unlikely. So uh, now going back to uh, going to computation neuroscience. So uh, the gold standard model that we have for decision making is based uh, on this schematic, uh, based on uh, competing neural uh, uh, populations. So the idea is that we have uh, independent or personally independent pools of neurons that are selected for uh, specific features of uh, objects in, in the world. And the relative strength of these uh, inputs, along with the uh, 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 competition mediated by inhibition between these two neural populations, uh, finally leads to a winner. And this the winner population is going to be the one that is going to correspond to the selected, uh, selected uh, um, uh, offer in this case. So these and similar models have dominated uh, uh, decision-making neuroscience over the last uh, 30 years. But I would like to, to, to think a little bit more about these uh, models and see how do they scale to more complicated, realistic uh, uh, decision-making problems like, uh, like this one. So if you're in, front of, in this environment, you may have many, many different offers that you can uh, choose from. So it's very unlikely that we're going to have uh, independent or separate uh, uh, neural populations uh, representing each of the offers that uh, you may encounter in the environment. And also what will happen if you have a new offer that you have never encoded, that will mean that you will need to reserve some neurons for uh, representing this new offer that shows up in the, in the environment. So these models, uh, don't uh, don't seem to scale well in this kind of situations, just because of the wiring that you will need to uh, to have, uh, uh, because of the the splitting of the neural population into too many uh, uh, subpopulations. So um, this is uh, John Ward with uh, Benjamin Hayden. Uh, we propose a third type of uh, of models that solve this uh, scaling uh, uh, problem. Uh, so the idea is that uh, is that uh, we have. We have a single pool of neurons, which is quite homogeneous, um, that is going to be devoted to the calculus of the value uh, of the offer that is attended to in a particular time. So essentially, offers are going to be attended uh, sequentially, uh, not in parallel, as uh, you will do over here. So essentially, here, we need an attentional mechanism that will select uh, one of the items in, uh, in the environment for further uh, scrutiny. So 
So these type of models are good, not only because they solve the, the scaling uh, problem, but also because they are very realistic in the sense that uh, this is pretty much the way we work in the, in the natural environment because we have eyes. So we typically don't see all these uh, offers at the same time. We can only see one of them clearly at a time. Uh, but this works in the, in the natural conditions in the environment. But what about the abstract decisions? And in abstract uh, decisions, like for instance, like thinking of uh, going to the supermarket, a priori, uh, you don't need to move your, your eyes for, to solve this task. And uh, a priori, you could split your neural resources into, into uh, uh, non-overlapping neural populations to think simultaneously of several options or several alternatives uh, that you're interested to, to, to get into, into the future. So, um, so we uh, address the question of what type of models will uh, uh, explain even uh, more realistic, uh, uh, complicated uh, scenarios. And uh, we, uh, to, to address this question, we trained uh, human participants. We asked uh, human participants to solve a complex uh, decision-making task. So this task is going to be. Uh, uh, there is first a context, uh, like uh, what would you rather have a nightmare with? So this is like an expected uh, context that you never thought about that uh, a priori. Uh, then you're going to be uh, shown uh, two uh, alternatives, and then you have to choose uh, one of them. So we're going to see, and by the way, uh, so we are uh, looking at this uh, uh, this. Uh, um, uh, 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 this uh, a, a stimulus, we're showing this a stimulus, we're going to record the movements of, uh, of the participants. So I'm going to show you um, the first condition of the experiment. So again, there's going to be a context. We are looking at the, uh, the eye movement, the, the eye gaze, the gaze is the, the red dot. Now you have the two uh, targets, the two uh, offers, and now you can choose one of them. This is a, a second example. The context, two offers. Now you can choose uh, one of them. So, so not very surprisingly, because the offers are uh, segregated spatially, you need to look at them uh, sequentially. And this naturally triggers a very sequential process where you only uh, encode and evaluate one offer at a time. But what happens in situations where you don't need to move your eyes? So now I'm going to have a, a second condition of very much the same experiment where images are going to disappear uh, in the late phase. So this is, a, a, again, a context. Two offers appear. But now they're going to disappear. And we keep track of the gaze of the participant as uh, as uh, the participant is making uh, his mind or her mind about the, about the choice. This is the second example. So in the previous, uh, in the first condition, uh, we saw that uh, people naturally move their eyes uh, and we naturally interpret this, uh, this uh, gaze behavior as, uh, as encoding and evaluating the offer that you are paying attention to. But what we have seen is that in conditions where this doesn't need to be uh, uh, done, like in this uh, second scenario, we still see that the uh, participants uh, gaze to the two empty uh, uh, squares. This doesn't seem to work very nicely. Okay, this, uh, this uh, uh, empty uh, regions, as if the image were presented over there. Actually, we don't find much difference in terms of reaction times and other features of the behavior among these two conditions. So the natural interpretation is that as, as people are looking at these empty uh, regions, there is the recollection or the reactivation of the memory that was associated to that, uh, to that specific uh, uh, location. So um, this previous um, um, uh, uh, data, uh, really shows that uh, models like uh, attentionally, uh, attentionally aligned uh, models are not only good models of uh, what happens uh, when you have offers in front of you, but also they could be good models of uh, abstract decisions where you have to direct your internal attention to different pieces of uh, information, including uh, memory, uh, memory uh, bits. So this idea uh, uh, resembles uh, what has been uh, proposed in philosophy and, uh, and uh, in uh, machine learning and, and uh, artificial intelligence, simulation, all these concepts. 
uh, where things are evaluated sequentially uh, rather than uh, uh, in parallel. So in my uh, um, in the latest part of my talk, I'm going to talk about what are the neural correlates of this uh, of this phenomenon. Essentially, whether there is reactivation of this uh, uh, of uh, our uh, our presented uh, con uh, a content as we gaze to a uh, to a uh, location where this was uh, presented. So. Um, uh, in the laboratory of uh, Benjamin Hayden, two monkeys were uh, trained to perform a, a complex uh, gambling uh, task. So uh, this is the, the first uh, thing that the monkey finds uh, is, the, is a fixation uh, cross. But afterwards, the monkey is free to gaze uh, whatever it wants. OK, so after the, the presentation cross, the first offer is uh, presented. This is you know, on, on to the uh, left side of, of the screen. So um, the monkey knows, uh, because of the training, that the color of this lower part uh, of this bar corresponds to the magnitude of the reward that they can get, can be large, medium, or, or small. And it also knows that the height of this bar corresponds to the probability of getting uh, getting this reward. So this is a, a quite complex uh, uh, evaluation uh, process because it involves perception. So you need to uh, compute the height of the of this bar. The color is not that difficult, but then you have to combine these two features into a single uh, value uh, estimate, which we are going to call expected value, which is the product between this magnitude and the probability. So importantly for us, after this uh, offer one presentation, there is a delay where gaze is totally free. Then there is going to be the, the second offer, which is uh, presented on the other side with exactly the same structure as before, but where the, both the reward magnitude and the probability are chosen uh, randomly and independently from the, from the first offer. Then there is going to be a delay uh, to period and then there is a refixation condition where the animal has to look at it so that the, the two offers are presented and now the animal can choose. Uh, finally, one of them by looking at uh, one of them, for instance, this one, and if the, if with the probability, uh, the result of the, of the gain was uh, positive, then it will get uh, this uh, reward. Okay, so the first thing that uh, we want to ask is whether gaze uh, predicts the choice uh, of the animal. That's the best, first uh, basic question. Um, but before that, I'm going to I'm going to tell you the, the hypothesis that, the, that we're going to uh, be looking at. So the first question is whether in this experiment we do you need to look at the offer to encode that offer, or you can use peripheral vision to to encode the uh, uh, encode the offer. So that's the very first uh, basic uh, question. Um, a more interesting question is going to be what happens in the delay period. As uh, the animal is looking at the empty regions, the question is whether there is a reactivation of a memory corresponding to the, to the offer that has been presented uh, previously in that uh, region. And the finally important question is whether this reactivation is important for re-evaluating the, the offer, or is it simply corresponds to just a mnemonic uh, um, experience that the animal has. So. This is the, uh, the gaze behavior of, uh, of the animal in a heat map. Uh, so initially, the animal has to look at uh, the center. So the, here you see that in most of the trials, the animal uh, starts uh, looking at that. So this is the first uh, offer being presented. So in most of the trials, the animal looks at the left, but not in all the trials, as you can see, and this is going to be uh, important. Uh, now, in the, in the delay two period, uh, something interesting happens. In some trials, the animal keeps looking at the left location, but in many other trials, the animal uh, switches to, to the right side of the, of the screen. Then second offer appears, a animal looks most often to, to the right side. And now the most interesting uh, observation that we already see uh, uh, behavior here is that in the delay two, there is an almost equal splitting of uh, gaze in the two sides of the screen. And this is going to be very handy to do the, the analysis because we have many different types of trials. Uh, um, so then there is a, a refixation, and then one of the two uh, uh, targets are, are chosen. OK. So, so again, what I said before, the first basic question is whether gaze predicts uh, choice. 
So um, to quantify gays, uh, so we we have doing we have done this in uh, several uh, ways, but the simplest way and the one that actually has worked uh, best is uh, by computing the fraction of time that the animal is looking at uh, the right side of the screen across the uh, relative to the midline, uh, divided by the total time that is looking inside uh, uh, the screen, and we can compute this fraction of looking at the right side in different periods. Uh, uh, of the of the task, but also in, in, in different time beings inside each of these uh, periods. So what I'm going to be plotting over here is for this uh, for this uh, uh, period, the probability of choosing the the uh, right offer as a function of the difference between the expected value of the right offer minus the expected value of the, the left offer. So not very surprisingly, uh, the monkey is performing well the task. So if the right target uh, has a higher value, then the the number is positive, and then the probability of choosing the right target is uh, the right offer is uh, is higher. But what is very important to, to uh, see right here is that there is a dependence on where the animal is looking at, uh, even when you uh, condition to, uh, to the difference of the respective values of the offer. So for instance, over here, if the animal is looking at the right side for a fraction of time larger than 0.5, we see that the, the, the tuning, the, the, um, the psychometric curve goes, uh, moves upwards, actually move, move, moves towards the left, but you see that the cyan curve is above the, the blue uh, one. And that means that the, when the animal is looking at the right side, there is an increased uh, probability for it to choose uh, the right offer. So we confirm that this effect cannot be explained by other factors that uh, we know that monkeys uh, care about, such as uh, risk of the offers, uh, um, as, whether there are some uh, uh, spatial biases to prefer right or left, and nothing like that uh, explains fully the, the, the behavior. You need to include also the fraction of time look, uh, looking at uh, one of the two, uh, the two sides. So now let's go to, uh, to neural data. So here, uh, Ben uh, recorded the uh, areas uh, 11 and 13 in the, in the macaque uh, prefrontal uh, uh, cortex. Um, so I'm going to be showing to you uh, pictures like this all the time. So, so I'm going to explain this in some detail. So on the y-axis, I'm uh, plotting uh, the fraction of significant cells as a function of time. And the fraction of significant cells is going to be regarding uh, encoding one or uh, one of these two uh, uh, quantities, the expected value of the left offer, that is the one that appears on the left, or the expected value of the right offer, which is the one that appears uh, on the right. Okay, not very surprisingly, if you look at encoding of these variables before a stimulus onset, there is nothing, I mean, because these uh, stimulus have not been uh, presented yet. But um, when the first offer is presented, the one on the, on the left, there is encoding, of the of the expected value of that offer that uh, diminishes over time, and when the second offer is uh, presented, uh, uh, that corresponds to the right offer, then there is an alternation over here, and now the there are a fraction of neurons that uh, represent the value of that uh, of that offer. But uh, of course, here the the critical analysis is to condition these uh, effects on the gaze uh, where the animal is uh, is uh, looking at. So here I have the, the, the conditions that I'm going to be interested in. So here I have these two variables that I, I'm caring about, uh, the respective values of the left and the right offer. But I'm going to be looking at the encoding of these variables when the animal is looking at the left in different time periods or uh, looking uh, at the right. So um, this is start simple. Here I'm putting again the fraction of significant cells as a function of time. Uh, for encoding the first offer, the one that is presented on the left, and for the encoding of the second offer, the one that is presented on the, on the right. And I, as you can see, uh, not surprisingly, this is what we expect, regardless of where the animal is looking at, at this, in this pre-stimulus period, there is no encoding of uh, none of the, uh, of, the, of the offers. So uh, now the, uh, in this case, so we're going into into the offer one and delay one uh, periods over here. And first of all, we're going to be looking at, at uh, the encoding of the expected value of, of the left offer, the first offer, when the animal is looking at the right. So this will be like a mistrial. So the offer is presented on the left, but the animal, for whatever reason, is looking at the, uh, the right. And when this happens, then there is no encoding of the value of this offer. So it's totally like a, uh, an attended uh, uh, trial. 
So only when the animal is looking at the right side, uh, sorry, on the left side, um, there is encoding of the of that of that offer that is sustained over time in this working memory uh, trace that uh, uh, spans the, the the delay one uh, period. So in this, uh, now let's go to this uh, to this uh, button uh, plot over here. So now this is the encoding of the expected value of the right offer. The, spec the right offer is always presented in this schematics on the right. So when the, regardless of where the animal is looking at, there is no encoding of that expected value because it has not been yet presented. So this is what you expect. And when it's presented over here, um, what you see is that now the encoding of that uh, expected value depends on where the animal is looking at. So if the animal is looking at the, the right side, then you have this pale blue. The right side is precisely the location where this offer is. And only when the animal is looking at this right side, there is the encoding of, the, of that offer. This is kind of like a, what you will expect based just on, uh, on guessing behavior. But the most interesting result is what we see over here in this, uh, in this uh, phase over here. So this is the delay to period. In the delay to period, uh, there is nothing on the screen, as uh, if, you, if you remember. So previously, had the second offer has been presented. And here we are looking at the encoding of the, the expected value of the left offer, the one that was presented at the, uh, in the first place. So what you see is that if the animal keeps looking at the right, where the second offer has been presented, then there is no encoding of the expected value of the first offer. But if the animal, for whatever reason, uh, switches and looks at the left side, there is nothing on the screen, but you see now reactivation of this memory uh, corresponding to the encoding of the expected value of the left offer, the, 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 the one that has been presented before at the, uh, 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 at the beginning of the trial. So this is a reactivation that happens even when you have these structures, very really strong these structures in, in between. Uh, like the, offer, the second offer is a big destructure. Um, okay, and uh, so a second important question was that uh, whether this uh, reactivation uh, helps for reevaluating, to reevaluating the, 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 the offer. And this is what we find. We find choice-related activity uh, during this period. So I'm going to go uh, very fast. Um, for the interest of time. And now I'm going to uh, go a little bit further into the, into the gaze analysis. So this is a quite busy uh, uh, figure, but I'm going to describe yeah, the, the interesting one. Pretty much the other ones are controls. But this one is an interesting one. So here, uh, we are going to make sure that the, during the second offer presentation, so the, over here, the animal was looking at the right. So this was not only a destructure, but actually it was encoded. By the by the animal because the animal was looking at this uh, this offer in the in in the in this period but now in the in the in the delay period uh, after it we're going to be looking at whether the animal keeps looking at the right side or switches uh, gaze towards the left side when the animal keeps looking at the right side there is no encoding of the expected value uh, on the left the first offer but again when the animal looks at on the left there's, there is this nice uh, reactivation. Of a, of a memory that was encoded a long time ago. It was probably distracted by the encoding of an intermediate offer, and nevertheless, it survived, and we could uh, retrieve it over here. So I'm, I'm concluding now. Um, so this, I think, is, is good uh, evidence for this type of models, where it looks that even in complicated, uh, um, more complex uh, decision making, where a priori you don't need to uh, 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 focus attention to a specific bits of information internally, it looks that the same sequential process that we see with gazing in natural conditions in the, in, in the wild, we see it also internally. So essentially we are uh, looking at some kind of like uh, a mind's eye uh, dynamics uh, by looking at this uh, phenomenon. So I'm going to uh, really um, uh, mention that Demetrio Ferro, who is here, who is the, the guy who has uh, generated all these very beautiful uh, videos and uh, is, has been amazing work uh, so far. Uh, Benjamin Hayden, who has been a, a collaborator here. So this is my love and thanks for the funding sources.